All right, guys, so this lecture is a little bit different. It's top 10 kind of unscientific things I've learned about dunking slash jumping. So some of this stuff is the accumulation of what I've learned from other guys who I'm lucky enough to trust me with their training. So that includes guys like Isaiah, Tom Barnes at one point, Tony Crosby, worked with Jay Clark at one point, uh, Chris John, Dom, Travis, so Large Jimmy Large Legs over here, Richard Tan. Zazeo, Zyrus, there's a ton of guys. Billy. So there's a large Sutherland, B Rub, Zeus. <laughs> there's a large list of guys that I've been able to learn from over the years because I didn't grow up actually trying to be a professional dunker. All I wanted to do was basically what Steven wanted to do, which was be T dub and just freaking fly and dunk the ball on everyone. And I pretty much got a good one hander when I was in high school, and I was like, all right, that's it, I'm good. And then obviously, you know, guys like Isaiah came up and, you know, I was in grad school and Isaiah was East Bang and I was like, how is this 16, 17 year old kid so talented and basically became obsessed with learning everything I could about dunking because I didn't really make much progress since I was 14 or 15. So that being said, all of this stuff is basically what I've learned since I was 13 until now I'm 30 years old. Uh, so been obsessed with the sport for a very, very long time. Like I said, some of this stuff is generally unscientific. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that there's research studies that are gonna demonstrate all of this stuff, but I felt like this might be a little bit more interesting than me telling you a lot of the same stuff that Dan told you yesterday that uh, aligns with pretty much stuff you could find in a textbook. So the first thing I wanna say is that the biggest mistake people make is that they spend time on things that do not matter. I'll say that again. The number one mistake that people make is that they spend time on things that do not matter. So the reason this slide is up here is because the number of questions that I get asked about stuff that doesn't matter is, is so like numerous, I, I could not even tell you. So some examples of that would be questions that I get about rolling out or massage or static stretching, uh, questions about the, the nuances of sleep or uh, whether they should eat a baked potato or a sweet potato or some of the stuff that really doesn't matter. Um, so the whole point of this lecture is to teach you guys 10 things that I've learned actually matter, that make a difference in your long-term progress. If you want to become an elite athlete, if you want to develop uh, in the same way that Dom has over the last couple of years, or uh, I'm trying to think of Travis is another good example. Archie is another good example. Guys that have just made consistent progress over two to three to four, five, and so on and so on years. So number one, the most important thing, the number one most important exercise that I have single-handedly found, the most important workout, and you guys really shouldn't be that surprised, is a jumping workout. And that jumping workout is having dedicated sessions. And when I say dedicated sessions, it's not going to the basketball court and having the intention of hooping for a little bit and then maybe dunking. It's having a dedicated jump session every single week. So how many of you guys have a structured jump session? Something that you go in and you know exactly how many jumps you're gonna take, you know how long you're gonna jump, you have a dedicated warm up to get you to 100%. How many of you guys have that? Okay, that's, that's actually pretty decent. But the best jump workout is one where you go in and you jump until your legs are absolute mashed potatoes. That is essentially the number one thing I have found makes the biggest difference. And this is specific. So one big mistake that I see people make is they think that if they go do jump session, jump session, jump session, jump session, and they're not at 100%, that they're gonna get better. That is not the case. If you do not push to 101% of your intent or, or your ability, you will not improve. I'll say that again. If you are jumping with anything less than 100%, you're not gonna improve. The reason for that is because your nervous system to make those new connections has to be pushed. So a huge mistake I see is one, guys don't have intent. They go into the session, they're not treating it like a workout, they're treating it like a performance. That's the wrong mindset. You should get the reps in. If you had a terrible session the other day, it doesn't matter. View it as a, as a workout. Like, there are times where I will go in, jump, 40 seconds later, I'm doing my next rep. 40 seconds later, I'm doing my next rep. 40 seconds later, I'm doing my next rep. I'm not screwing around, I'm not playing five on five, I'm trying to jump higher. And every single rep has a purpose. 
So it's either to warm me up or to build confidence for another dunk that I'm trying to do or to prep me for the thing that I'm trying to do later in the session, which is get to 101% of my effort. So what's the number one issue or the number one thing that happens when guys push to 101% effort? What usually happens when guys get to that intensity? Injury. So it's really important that when you have these jump workouts and you're pushing to that intent, you do a proper warm up and you build into it. So I have an example session that uh, you know, I've, I've done, or I guess a structure that I typically do. So typically I'll come in, I'll warm up for 10 to 30 minutes, and honestly it's started, it started with a structured warm up, uh, something very, very routine. Now I've started to get basically just into shooting around because you get low level plyo contacts, I can get used to the ball in my hand. Then I'm essentially gonna build up the intensity of my jumps. For me, it's doing one-handed layups. Big reason why I picked that is because I pull my hamstring really often. So if I just go and throw a lob and full speed run at it, and I'm almost 30 years old, I've been jumping for 17 years, at max intent, I'm gonna pull my hamstring. So I have to build into it really, really slowly. Typically, it'll take me, it could take 20 to 30 jumps to get up to 100%. You can ask Isaiah, Isaiah, how, many, how long would it take you to get to 100% max effort 50.5 inch vertical on any given day, if you had to guess. How many jumps? Yeah, from like baby jump to 50.5. 20 to 30 jumps. That's warming up the engine, right? It's getting the pistons going. Then I'll typically do 20 to 30 more jumps. So that's 60 jumps, but they're not max intensity. And that's the most specific warm up. You can ask Isaiah, this is maybe another thing. The most specific warm up for jumping is jumping. And that was a big mistake I made early on. I would have guys do this massive track and field warm up and then go into max effort jumping. But I never really had them progress their intensity of their jumps throughout the session. Another big mistake people make, they rest way too long and their tendons basically become cooled down and stiffen. So ideally, these dunk sessions where you guys have like 30 people on a hoop, not really ideal. The rhythm of the session is basically ruined. You can't build confidence because you're not getting consistent makes and I'll go into that a little bit later. So number two, do we wanna think long-term or short-term? Long-term. The number two biggest mistake I see people make is they take this route. They think that they're gonna get better in three months, in four months, or five months. They think if I do the, the six like cycles that John wrote, at the end of the six mesocycles, I'm supposed to jump this high at this timeline because that's what's supposed to happen. Guess what, it might not happen because there's how many variables that are gonna impact your recovery, how, how well you were training, what was your sleep like, what was your diet like. So it's not this easy thing where I can just predict, oh, I put this equation in and this answer pumped, like popped out. My job is to basically try to get that to happen, but if my athletes don't do what they're, basically they don't do their part, they do the reps wrong, they don't have high intent on the things they're supposed to have high intent on, which is jumping, which is Olympic lifting, which is heavy squatting. They don't sleep right, they don't do their isos, they, they skip the warm up, they skip the sprinting, they eat like garbage. Well, it's gonna be really, really hard for them to make improvement within six months even. So the reason that I get better every single year at 30 years old almost, I'm gonna be the best I've ever been, right? How is that possible? Well, because I had a long-term mindset. And I honestly can't relate to people that quit or they lose motivation. I, I cannot relate to that. It's something Isaiah can't relate to. I can't relate to it. Some of my best athletes can't relate to it. I'm assuming, Brandon, you're probably the same way as an Olympic bobsled athlete. You don't relate to it. Even if you fail, you just keep going. And when people quit, that's when, that's when you're, you're done. You lose, you lost the battle. So if you wanna make long-term progress, you have to somehow figure out how to become process-oriented and process focused and keep going. As soon as you quit, the journey's over. You stop training, the journey's over. You're done. You're gonna lose, you're gonna detrain for six months to eight months to a year, and now you're gonna be set super far back, and the older you are, when you stop, the more you detrain. So it even has more of a consequence. How many of you guys didn't train hard between last year and this year? Raise your hand high. There's a tie, no, you're one of them, right? So when you do that, you, you limit yourself. You have basically capped the potential for you to, to be better than you previously were. So it's keep taking steps forward, even if they're little baby steps and learn from the mistakes. I pulled my hamstring a month ago. How many of you guys knew that? Maybe a couple of you guys. I didn't post it anywhere. I didn't want anyone to know it. 
because I was like pretty frustrated. I just put five months into it, got back on the horse, and just decided to take steps forward. Is my hamstring 100%? I guess we're gonna find out in 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, so number three, fat don't fly. Dan Back trolled me for this yesterday, but it's true. Usain Bolt is probably five to 6% body fat. Consistently, specifically for one foot jumping, in my experience, being leaner has pretty much always helped me. Now this is not necessarily true for some of the other guys, uh, for like two foot jumpers per se, but as a one foot jumper, I have consistently observed and seen time and time again that I will jump higher if I am leaner. If I'm a fatty, I'm not gonna jump high. And when I say fat, it's in the terms of an, of an athlete. I'm comparing myself to an Olympic level athlete. I'm not comparing myself to, you know, Joe Blow or whatever else. I'm trying to be absolutely optimum in my body composition. That said, we don't wanna form body dysmorphia. It's really common for all of us who have incredibly obsessive tendencies, which is why all of you are here and love dunking, because you obsess about it, to obsess about our weight. So you need to try to find a way to do this without becoming hyper obsessive about it and not sleeping and getting anxiety and recovering poorly because you're just hyper focused on this. So yeah, being leaner matters, but I don't, I still, I'll be honest, I will go out and I'll enjoy a beer because I have to have this balance between, again, what is the long-term thing I wanna achieve? If I just, you know, light, light a candle at both ends, I'm gonna burn out, right? If I track every single macro I take in, every single calorie, every thing, single thing I consume and I have a scale, I'm gonna burn out. It's not sustainable, right? So you need to find strategies, big picture strategies that work for you. For me, it's drinking a lot of milk. I drink a, sh a, lot, of, a lot of milk. A lot of skim milk, a lot of fair life milk. I lose a lot of weight doing that. Has a lot of protein, has a lot of carbohydrates, has very low fat, right? You heard Dan talk yesterday about the importance of carbohydrates in your diet. That's one of the things that you cannot skimp on if you wanna be a speed power athlete. I had a meeting with one of my athletes. Generally, you wanna have about one gram per kilogram of fat in your diet, right? I think it comes out to like 30% or 25%. His was 60%. And he's like, I feel like garbage, I can't jump high. And I'm like, yeah, no Sherlock. Like, you're, you're consuming just straight fat. You might as well have a tub of Crisco and just spoon it out into your mouth, right? So we need to, we need to dial this in, but we don't wanna become hyper obsessive about it. And I've seen consistently that carbohydrates are the fuel for high intensity exercise. It's not just running a mile and that's considered you know, high intensity exercise. For speed power events, carbohydrates are gonna be the thing that fuels those high power, high speed efforts. So number four, caffeine. Time and, and you know, obviously if you're Mormon or whatever or LDS and you don't wanna take caffeine in, that's fine. I'm sure there's other alternatives, but some sort of stimulant that revs up your nervous system is very, very, very effective when it comes to time to exhaustion, and that is evidence-based, we've seen that time and time again, and also peak power output. So if I have the best session I've ever had, I'm not gonna lie to you, I had three massive Red Bulls and my heart was pounding out of my chest, I walked in, I felt like absolute garbage, but I jumped stupidly high. It's the CMU session at 10 foot, and I was like looking at the rim, and I was like, I have no idea what's happening. And then I walked outside and got a $50 parking ticket. Shout out Ryan Nagel. <laughs> It was, like, it was like, yeah, no, that sucks. <laughs> and the worst part was I walked up to my car and she was like writing the note and putting it on my car. I was like, that's my car, that's my car, I'm leaving now. And she was like, it's been here for 32 minutes. You're two minutes over. And I was like, this sucks. So caffeine, I've consistently noticed taking it a little bit earlier in the day because it has a half-life works for me. So it's a stimulant, which basically means it's gonna start to push uh, depending on, let's see how I can explain this. So it will cause what is essentially an anxiety response. Okay, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna put you into fight or flight, which is good because that means the blood is gonna move to the working muscles. If the blood moves to the working muscles, they're mobilized for you to run from a T-Rex that's chasing you, to avoid the saber-toothed tiger from catching you, right? To defend yourself against someone who's trying to take over your encampment or whatever else it may be. So that fight or flight mechanism, there is an optimum level for it. So if you're too amped up, what can happen is this, and Riley's talked about this, it's called the performance arousal curve, you can actually have your performance decrease. So what you wanna try to do is take, find and test, what is the optimum amount of caffeine for me when I'm in a session, and what is the optimum amount of caffeine for me when I'm with other people? So for example, today, there's a ton of people here. All week I've been amped up and anxious and stuff like that. 
my performance as a result might go down because I'm too excited. So you gotta try to calm down if you feel yourself too jittery. Like I put in headphones and I listen to country music because what is more calming than that? Absolutely nothing. You might as well fall asleep. <laughs> so number five, build confidence. Yes, Richard. Um, how early before your jump session would you take your caffeine? So he asked how early would you take your caffeine? Everyone's a little bit different. In my experience, you wanna take it bare minimum 30 minutes. Like that's the latest I would take it. Caffeine, I mean, what you have to remember is when you start drinking caffeine, it's immediately putting you in that fight or flight sympathetic response, right? So if that happens earlier, you're starting to mobilize blood essentially to the working muscle. So what I've experienced is in the morning, and like I said, this is unscientific, but this is my experience. When I drink caffeine, my heart will start beating a little harder, right? I start walking around and I'm warming up a little faster, even if I'm doing nothing. So if I wake up at 7.30 and I have my first cup of coffee, and I drink my second at, I don't know, like 9.30 or whatever else, if I'm dunking at one, I've generally found that that's been the most effective for me. If I drink it right before the session, usually it doesn't quite hit in time, and even though it might peak during the session, I usually don't feel as warm as if I take it earlier in the day. Who knows if it's just a warm liquid and it just makes me feel all good inside, I don't know, but that's my experience. So drinking coffee in the morning and earlier before the session and allowing the half-life to kind of come down over time and your body to rev up and stay revved up for a bit generally feels good. Because if you take it right before and you peak during your session, what can happen? What happens if your, your anxiety and your excitement peaks during the session and there's a bunch of people around and you're really nervous? Your performance is gonna drop. So you have to try to play around with it and dial it in. And there's obviously some psychological mechanisms that you can use, um, but we'll get into this next point. So this one's build confidence. How many of you guys have ever had the feeling that before you throw a lob or before you start that first dribble, you look at the rim, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna absolutely annihilate this dunk. Like I am gonna freaking crush this. Raise your hand high if you've ever had that inner confidence. High, high, raise it high. Are those your best jumping days? Raise, leave your hand high if you've had that feeling. Yes, right? So what I've learned to get into that flow state, to get into that sensation of just this unwavering confidence, this like inner, uh, I don't even know, it's like, a, it's like a beast comes out of you, that type of, that type of sensation, you have to build confidence throughout the session. So how do you do that? How do you build confidence? If you guys ever have gone into a session, you're missing everything, you probably don't have that sensation. I'm talking of like when you're like, I cannot miss. And you get it in basketball, but you also get it in dunking. And it's energetic, it feels so powerful. Every step is energetic and confident. To get that, for me personally, is after makes. So if you're practicing misses, it's gonna be really hard to get in this confident kind of flow state where you're having fun. So you need to practice makes. If you're just missing and missing and missing and missing, odds are you're not gonna feel very good about your performance. You guys would agree with that, right? So what I've realized is, for me, I'll start with those layups like I said, and if I can do a, lay, if I can do a one hander off the dribble, I know on 10 feet, I'm like, all right, I know that that takes a decent amount of effort. So if I throw a lob right now, I'm gonna destroy it. Right, so I'll punch a couple one-handers off the dribble. Once I make one or two of those, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling good right now. Throw a lob, how was that? If I punch it, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing all right. So once I get that first make, it, it's like it stacks. So every make for me builds more and more confidence and my performance goes up and up and up. As soon as I stop or I get too many misses, plummets. How many of you guys have had that experience? Raise your hand really, really high. Yep, so we wanna build confidence. We wanna practice makes. And it's not just for the sake of motor learning, but it's for the sake of having that inner energetic beast come out of you. And there's not really a, a, a psych, I mean, maybe flow state you could call it, I don't really know. But for me, I've noticed that those are my absolutely most aggressive, violent, reckless takeoffs where I will get my head close to the rim. And I do not miss. And if I miss, I'm like, oh, I flew. Could have put my elbow on the rim on that. Feels amazing. <clears throat> so number six, front loading the week. We talked about this yesterday with Dan when he was talking about the performance curves and stuff like that and deloading. How many of you guys remember that? Raise your hand if you remember him talking about front, like the performance curves, Burko Shansky. Okay, so what this is saying is what happens after you peak? You ever heard the term soon ripe, soon rotten? That's essentially what happens when you peak. When you peak, you drop all your training and you perform like super freaky and then you're like, well now what? Do I go back to the, do I go back to the the drawing board and, and write a whole new training plan and try to surpass what I did previously? I would not. When in my experience, the thing that works most effectively, and you can ask these two because they dunk with me a lot, 
was front loading the week. So we would dunk on Fridays or Saturdays, I would lift really heavy on Monday, moderate on Wednesday, and then I would jump super high on Friday or Saturday. What happens is you basically train, if we're viewing point one, right, the jump workout, that was workout one. Then you took a day or two off, if that was Friday or Saturday, right, it's Monday. So now I'm five days from my next session, maybe six. If I do a heavy strength session, I can recover in six days. Now, what if I load really, really heavy on Wednesday? Can I recover if I'm doing my session on Friday in two days? Maybe, but it's pretty risky. Probably wouldn't do that. And if you've been loading for a period of time, fatigue stacks. And you, those of you who have trained with me, you've noticed when it's week three of a cycle, you're drudging through it. That's okay, that's fine. You're training to train. But when you're performing, you're not training. You're trying to perform and maintain performance. So I call it working in windows of opportunity, and I've consistently noticed that when I do that, I'm able to dunk more frequently, I'm able to stay injury free, and I'm able to maintain a very, very high vertical within an inch of my all-time best. So I view it in periods of loading, where I'm trying to push that ceiling higher, and then I view it basically of floating at that ceiling. And that's when I'm front loading, that's when I'm maintaining. So I just lifted from February to basically, I think it was uh, May, the middle of May. I started unloading, and it takes about a month for me to freshen up as a one-foot jumper. Two-foot jumpers are maybe a little quicker, depending on how hard you train. Like these guys, because I have been coaching them one-on-one -on -one for a, a while, they're still a little bit fatigued, and they're coming out of that hole, right? So it was the F2 curve that Dan showed us the other day. So what they want to do is maintain that and maintain jumping high, because they can do the most important thing, which is jump workouts at 101% of effort. They're not limited by their training volume. They're not wearing a fatigue weight vest. Number seven, look the ball into your hand. So when you guys throw lobs, how many of you guys know where, where your eyes are tracking? Raise your hand if you know where you look, right? A couple of you guys do. How many of you guys are like, I actually have no freaking clue where I look? Raise your hand high. So most of you guys have no idea what, where to look. You just kind of throw the ball and arbitrarily run at it. So what you typically want to do, and I've asked Connor about this, I've asked Isaiah about this, I've asked, uh, I, don't, I haven't asked Kilgannon, but I've watched his videos. Traditionally what they do is they'll look generally where they want the ball to go. This is what I do on my best days. So I'm looking, I want the ball in this vicinity. I throw the lob and my eyes transition right to the ball. What this does is it allows me to figure out my rhythm because I'm not focused on the rim. If you jump for the rim, you're gonna go and touch the rim. If you jump for the ball, you're gonna go get the ball. So in my head, I tell myself, go get it. So I'll just throw it up, I look at it, I'm like, yep, that's the one, and I'm just staring right at the ball. I'll look at where I wanna throw it, as I'm throwing it, I basically transition to the ball and I'm looking right at the ball. That sets up my rhythm, it sets up my galloping, it sets up my timing, and it allows me to attack the, 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 uh, the approach. So if you throw a bad lob, how many of you guys feel confident dunking it? If you throw a terrible lob? Yeah, maybe one person. <laughs> So getting this good goes back to the point I said previously, which is what? Yeah. Throwing good lobs would build what? Confidence. So if you throw good lobs and you know how to throw a good lob, you can go get it and you can be reckless and you can make the dunk and you can build confidence and you can stack that confidence and that inner beast can come out of you and you can be at 101% and then you can get better over time. So all this stuff adds up. It all comes together and it ends up yielding really, really, really impressive performance improvements. Can you press next on this slide, Hunter? Number eight, 15 minute walks. You go to the next one. 15 minute walks. Why 15 minute walks? Back health. So many people came up to me and they're like, dude, my back hurts, what do I do? Have you walked for 15 minutes? No, okay, well start there. And this is essentially the isometric for your back. Big arm swings, walking 15 minutes. Functions as nerve flossing. Basically desensitizes the nerve. Stu McGill probably knows more about backs than anyone else in the entire world. I, one of my best friends is a chiropractor. Actually, two of my best friends are chiropractors. A couple of them are PTs. They can confirm 15 minute walkings with big arm swings. Not gonna be detrimental for your performance. Back's gonna be better. Travis has had this experience. He's probably not over here and I'm gonna Punish him eternally for it. Thanks, Travis. <clears throat> I don't even know where he is. Anyways, oh, you're here. On your phone, probably. Chit-chatting. Flirting with Corey. 
All right, number nine. And Isaiah told me this one. That's try to hit a new dunk every single session. And why are these guys up here? Because it's basically like new character. You want to try to unlock a new dunk or a new character every time you have a session. If your goal is to be good at dunking, this is a really, really simplistic, big picture thing that can help you coordinate your sessions. It can help you plan your sessions, it can help you figure out what rim height you want to dunk on, and it can help you improve. Now, if you don't have access to a rim that goes up and down, this might be difficult, right? Because if you're only dunking on 10 feet and you're like, oh, I can do a one-hander consistently, well, it's probably going to be hard for you to like, put the, like, do a windmill you know, or, or do it between the legs. So even if it's one-inch increments, try to hit a new dunk every single session, which brings me maybe to an additional point, which is have access to a low rim. Low rimming is one of the best ways to build confidence. So when you throw the lob and you're looking at the ball and you're approaching it, you'll attack the takeoff and you'll be aggressive and you'll grab the ball and you'll whip it between your leg and then you'll freaking throw it in the hoop. That's one of the best things you can do to build technique. Dom, would you say that low rimming is one of the biggest keys for why you're such a wizard at five foot eight? Yeah. You would agree, right? Who else low rims a lot, okay? Would you guys say that that's one of the most important things in improving your technical dunk skill, right? How many of you would be like, nah, it doesn't do anything? That's what I thought. And I'm, same thing here, one big issue with this, when you low rim, you need to still be at 101% of effort. One big mistake people make is that they don't, they don't go 101% effort. They're like, oh, I'll just be at 70%. Well, when the rim goes up to 10 feet, are you gonna be able to jump as hard as possible? You're running faster. Your approach is gonna start from further back. You're gonna have to get the ball through your leg faster. So for me, what I'll typically do, I've noticed works for me is I'm eight, nine to nine, three. I'm in that range. I throw my lob for East Bay's. I punch the sole out of it. I go back and I do it again. And I just try to punch it harder and harder and harder. And then I'll go over to 10. I don't do the incremental jumps. A lot of guys like to do that. For me, it just wrecks my confidence. I'm like, well, I can't make it on 9.4. I'm definitely not going to make it on 10. So that bigger jump for me, for whatever reason, has always helped. I think if I get stuck at a certain height, then it kind of decreases confidence because I'm practicing misses. So at that 8.9 to 9.3, I know there's no limiter on my vertical. I'm missing because my technique sucks, and I'm not jumping very high on it. Then if I go to 10 feet, and I'm crushing it on 8.9, and CJ has, has talked about this before. He's like, based on how I finish a dunk on 9 feet, I know I can make it on 10. You agree with that, CJ? <clears throat> so number 10, ask yourself, is what I'm doing today going to make me better or worse tomorrow or two days from now? And I think most people screw this up. So what they did today will usually make them take two steps backwards instead of a tiny step forward. So for me, that mistake is when I don't warm up and I pull my hamstring, try knee space. And everyone's like, John, try an East Bay. You gonna East Bay? I'm like, I don't know. You wanna know why? Because my hamstring hurts, and I try to do an East Bay, I'm gonna do this, and I don't really wanna do that, because I gotta dunk in Dallas, and I don't wanna pull my hamstring again. So will I try? Yeah, will I make it? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, because I'm one step forward focused. I know that if I push that East Bay too hard, and I force it, and Jimmy was there the last time it happened, what happened? It. it just popped. I was like, well, I'm done, there we go. There's a month's time gone. They were late for the session, they didn't show up, I had, I had no friends there. They, they was like, all right guys, I'm gonna be here at this time, and they didn't, they didn't even come. What kind of friend, what kind of friend, what kind of friend are you? <laughs> but big picture, outside of trolling my friends, is you need to ask yourself that question. If I had asked myself after that jump before I pulled it, hey, should I cut this session, I felt something in my hamstring, I wouldn't have pulled my hamstring. But because I was like, uh, I don't really care, I gotta be at dunk camp in a month and I gotta do a session, it's the first week of the deload and if I don't do this, then I'm not gonna have high intent and I'm gonna push the risk reward relationship and end up hurting myself and now I'm two steps back. Isaiah does the same thing with his hip. And we, we go through this exercise all the time. Isaiah, is what you do today gonna make you feel better or worse two days from now? So Isaiah, you have this squat session yesterday, we're at the gym. He's, he's at, what, I think 225 or right? Feels good, I was like, okay, let's go. You know, let's see if we can do 265. He's like, well, I dunk in two days. I'm like, dude, it's like 50% of your max. Like, you're going to be fine. You squat like 405 or 440 at that depth. You're probably going to be fine if you do some slow reps at like 60%. He's like, oh, okay, cool. We go to 265. He's like, ah, I felt like a sharp pain in my knee or whatever else. I'm like, okay, cool. Don't keep going. Why? Because you're going to take two steps back. And in two days, you need to be one step forward. So what do we do? We drop the weight down to 235, and he does slow squats with a pause. Today, I have no idea. 
One out of 10 pain. Dom Gonzalez, same thing. I goes into the session on Monday, he's like, oh, my knee hurts. All that time's gone. I'm like, no, Dom, I have a secret. We're gonna do a jump warm up. Because jumping's the most specific thing for jumping, right? Do you guys agree with that? We talked about that earlier. So we just slowly ramp up the jumps over 20 to 30 jumps. Knee pain goes and goes down, builds confidence. All of a sudden decides he's gonna crush it behind the back on nine, 10 and a half, nine, 10 and three quarters. So it's really important to try to have all of this stuff and this big picture dialed in because that's how you make long-term progress, all right? So that sums it up, guys. I really wanna start just putting headphones in and dunking. But before I do that, round of applause, and then you can ask questions. <laughs> I was asked for a round of applause myself because I wanna make myself feel better, you know? Just make my ego a little inflated. So any questions, any questions that you guys have? Oh yeah. Generally, I've noticed Isaiah takes about a minute. I take 30 seconds to 45 seconds, because I'm a psychopath. Jordan Kilgannon takes three minutes. He's built different. What was the question? Oh, he said uh, rest interval between jumps. Rest interval between jumps. Any other questions? Sweet. Let's warm up. I'm going to warm up. Thanks. <laughs> Andy, do you want to say something? What do you want to say? You want me to convey it? Because I have all their attention. They're all looking at me, which kind of sucks. Because my performance arousal curve is too high. My performance is going to go down. And it's because you're not standing here. And I have to figure it out myself. I'm stalling. All right, here you go. Thanks for stalling. <laughs> hey, give it up for John one more time. Time to tank. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we break for lunch. One is 